Thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in to today's show. Today's guest is Kelvin Windsor. Kelvin uh, runs an organisation called AOG World Relief. And basically what he does is help uh, help the community there, empower themselves uh, both financially and in infrastructure, building themselves and establishing themselves to move forward. So without further ado, thank you very much for coming on to the show there, Calvin. Thanks, Neil. Pleasure to be here. You're welcome, buddy. So, yeah, Calvin, what's the weather like down there in – oh, sorry, should I say up there in uh, Vietnam? Yeah, so um, so we're the opposite to Australia, being in the Northern Hemisphere over here. Uh, so we're in our summer period now, June, July, bit of August. Um, and so, yeah, we're just um, – we're enjoying a nice bit of summer heat at the moment between the – mid to high 30s going into the 40s some days so it's nice and warm over here uh, lucky uh, i envy you mate uh down here in melbourne it's actually uh quite uh cold at the moment over the last few days we've had a bit of rain so yeah so um calvin tell me a bit about yourself yeah so um i grew up in um dufton dandenong um victoria um australia and um got two older siblings sisters and, um, yeah, I have um, went to school with yourself um, in high school, St. John's Regional College. And um, after college, I uh, did some university work and um, worked for the taxation office, did, some, um, did a degree in Australian taxation law, wanted to be in accounting and um, do finances and stuff like that. Um, and then one day I was on a short-term trip overseas looking at some of the projects I church supported and um, came, uh, yeah, met, um, came over here to Vietnam and um, met my wife, who, well, who is now my wife, um, over here in Vietnam and we started dating online initially and um, connecting and, yeah, and then she moved back to Australia for a little bit. Um, she's from Sydney originally. We got married and then we found an opportunity and, and we came back over to Vietnam. Wow. So um, what motivated you to start uh, AOG World Relief? Uh, so we didn't start AOG World Relief. Uh, we're, I guess, the fourth um, directors or, or, or um, people in sort of pushing it forward. Um, it started back in 1995 um, yeah. where a couple came in um, and they wanted to um, work out with the church here in Vietnam and they asked the church here in Vietnam, what can we do to help you? Um, as a as an organization, as a, as a movement. And they basically said, look, we really want someone to do some community development work um, to, to help with that process there, to really get involved and just show the government that, you know, uh, we're, we're nice people. And so that's moved on. And then um, um, probably two or three years into that, they um, someone else came on board and then um, – then our good friends at the moment, um, they took over. They were also, they were coming over to Vietnam to help with the second lot of people running the organization. And, yeah, and then a few things happened and the other couple had to leave. Um, and so our friends took over the organization. They started with a small handful of children um, doing child sponsorship, um, so about 50 kids. And the organization has just grown from there. So now we work in 120 different villages um, across two different provinces. Um, and, yeah, we do a whole bunch of things. Okay. So what, what, are those, what sort of things do you do with the, with the communities? Mm-hmm. So our main focus and our main premise here is uh, that we pursue justice to empower um, people to transform their community. So it's all about community-led development, what we do here. So, you know, the saying, you can feed a man um, and you'll feed him for a day or give a man a fish and you'll feed him for a day. Or if you teach a man to fish, you'll feed him for a lifetime. So our baseline premise is sort of based around that, that we want to teach people, we want to take them on a journey through a process of development. So um, it's not... Um, it's not just about throwing funds at a situation or a dilemma, but it's encouraging and walking through a people of a journey. 
So that's sort of our basis that we start with. And we, we once we go into a community um, in which the government, you know, indicates and, and shows us and, and gives us a, a community to work in, we t- take the community leaders in and we talk to them about the difference between a welfare mindset and development mindset and how they as a community have the power and the resources to change their own community. They don't need someone from the West to come in. They don't need someone with large pockets to come in and throw money at them. They themselves as a community can try and change and build their own community and bring the change that they want to see for their community in there. And then as we we go through that, uh, we look at different um, programs and processes that we can help the community with, um, so such things as clean water into primary schools or health stations. And clean water is such a simple thing. You know, in Melbourne, you can turn on tap, you, yeah. drink, you drink water straight from the tap. You can't do that here in Vietnam. Um, you know, you'll be in hospital the next day and you'll be on medications, just try and um, get stuff out of your stomach. And so clean water is a vital um, importance just within the, um, the development and the life of the community. It's a basic human need and a human right that people should ac- have access to clean water. So we help with water filtration systems within schools and primary schools and health stations. Um, And that really just, we see a lot of um, improvement and development within a community just based on that. We were in one community and um, the army had done a health check on some of the kids a few months before. We put in a filtration system and they came back a few months after that. And they saw a dramatic change in the overall health of the school and the children. Um, so, you know, with clean water in a school, kids stay in school longer. So they get a better education because they're learning more. Better education means that they can go out and get a better job, go to university or, or do the likes, and they can build up um, the atmosphere within the community. They can change the community as they themselves learn and get educated and grow. So we do simple stuff like that. We help with um, medical installments um, into villages. So village, each community has a sort of like a doctor's slash hospital area um, would be the best way to describe it. And so we help with equipment with them, maybe breathing apparatuses and stuff because a lot of people cook with charcoal and smoke within their house. So a lot of older people has, have respiratory issues um, and the use of pesticides sometimes within their farming needs so we help with stuff like that with um, needs for the for the doctors within the community sterile environment sterile equipment um and so basic things like that okay so you were saying um the whole water situation what's Mm. going on there like do they have uh, like a lot of bacteria and stuff um in their water at the moment it it really just depends on which community that you're in um, mm. and which part of the area if they're near the, the river or the beach or, or where it is. But essentially, um, all their water sources are, are not filtered out. So as you go in Melbourne, you've got the big um, dams and you've got the big reservoirs and, and they all go through a filtration process of some sort before they get to your house, whereas they don't have any of that in Vietnam. So the water that they're getting, usually from the ground or a river or water source, um, it's just got different elements in it. Each place is different depending on where they're located. Um, and so it's just trying to filter out some of those stuff that cause bacteria or infection within the body or just is not needed within it. Okay. So do you um, help like, uh, community start businesses and stuff like that um, to help themselves. Yeah, so one of the one of the other aspects that we do is um, uh, is called sort of an adopt a farmer program. So a lot of the the communities and villages that we work in, most of the people are farmers of some sort. Um, so that's a generally speaking. We do uh, we work in different areas that there aren't farmers and they have other occupations. But generally speaking, so what we like to try and do is we try and help the communities and the the people, I guess, sort of at the lower end within the community, uh, the poorest of the poor, Mm. um, so you could say, just to help generate more income for them. It's um, it's estimated that overall um, in our communities, each family sort of earns between $1 to $3 a day that they earn. And so that's not a lot of money um, Mm. if you consider it throughout a day. Most rice farms will only get um, two crops a year. 
And so that's not a lot of income coming through. And the, the government helps to subsidize some of their things within their lifestyle, but it's obviously quite a bit of a struggle for them. So we come in and try and help them help with how we can um, generate more income for them. Maybe that could be um, some livestock within their um, hood household, maybe be a goat or, or something like that that they can breed and then on sell. And so usually if it's a goat or something like that, then we buy them a male and a female goat. The goats can, can mate, they can um, sell their, their stock out and they can get a bit of, and they're a bit of a low um, upkeep or sometimes it's cows or chickens or ducks. Um, and so that sort of helps to generate some more income for them. And there's usually someone at home that can help along with those needs or it might be diversifying their crops. So they might have a bit of block of land on their current where their house is in the back. They may have a little bit of land, so we help them to generate more income. Maybe it would be a seed crop such as mangoes or bananas or papaya, depending on their area mm. and what works for them. Okay. So what is the average daily cost there in Vietnam for a person? Oh, well, that's, uh, that's a big open-ended question. It depends on where you are, whether or not yeah. you're in one of the big cities like Ho Chi Minh and Hanoi or you're out in the country um you know in some of the rural areas that we live in um so you know a very much differentiations between each people i mean you've got your upper class your middle class your lower class mm. um and so yeah it's hard to really sort of distinguish the lower class would probably um you know live on their basic needs of rice vegetables and maybe if they can get their hands on a bit of meat Mm. Um, they'll also do that. Some noodles thrown in there every other week, um, but most of their most of their diet in the um, in the rural areas would be rice, noodles, and some veggies. Okay, and you mainly work in the lower class areas, right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so um, do they have a lot of trouble? Like you talk about farming and stuff like that. I remember in the Vietnam War they. You know, the Americans, they sprayed, I think it was called Agent Orange. Is that right? Yeah. Um, does it still affect them to this day? Yeah, there is still some of a bit of an effect. Um, there's a lot of organizations who still has a bit of an effect on them. There's a lot of organizations that still do a bit of work specifically with Agent Orange. Um, but there's a little bit of effect that we kind of see. Um, and it kind of differentiates between whether or not it's Agent Orange or it's um, – you know, a, a lifestyle choice or pesticides that they use within their crops and their um, their eating and what sort of balances. Um, it's, I mean, I don't know the exact cause or I guess the exact of um, effect that it's currently having. Um, it has decreased over the years, but there is still a number of things. A lot of um, that has been seen has been with kids as they're growing up, um, disabilities that they the kids might encounter we do a lot of work with kids um, for heart diseases um, getting them with um, heart surgeries and also kids who need a mobility aid such as a wheelchair or a walking frame to help them um, establish themselves and um, get, get strength into their bodies oh, well wow. so you do you do a lot of great work there i see um thanks and i, and I really applaud you for that because uh, you know, the, as the world, as us humans, we all need to look after each other so we can all flourish mm. together. And um, unfortunately, you don't get as much help as you'd wish. Um, do you have any challenges when it comes to, you know, trying to help out these communities? Um, yeah, there's always, I guess, challenges with whatever work that you're doing. You always come against um, good parts of it. You always come against um parts that are sort of, you know, but, um, you know, you tear your head out with. Um, some of, I guess, the challenges is always a bit of, um, depending on the community that you're working with, um, how responsive, I guess, they are to, to want to change their own community, um, what level they want to get involved with, um, what resources they have. Um, probably one of our biggest challenges would be on, on a financial level and, and raising the support that is needed to, to keep some of our projects going, um, to get people out there, to get communities um, in need with um, the things that they want to, you know, move on as a community and, and help them and, and take them on that next journey. Uh, you know, there's also obviously difficulties sometimes with um, 
just raising funds and we're over here in Vietnam and um, talking with partners and, and community leaders and connecting them together, especially during these COVID times um, and how we can manage and incorporate that. So, so yeah, with the, the whole COVID situation, has it, you know, that alone, has it provided, cha- created challenges for you guys or has it been a lot easier? Uh, so, Vietnam in generally overall has done really well with COVID. Um, we've had quite a number of low cases. Population on Vietnam is something about 92 million um, and we've had, I think, just under 400 cases here in Vietnam. So the government's done a great job in containing things and putting measures into place. And um, Vietnam is a communist nation, so the people listen to the, to the government. They, you know, they want to do what they're told. They want to stop the stuff. So there's been – so the people were very compliant in restrictions that were put in place. Um, and so that sort of – that really helped with um, keeping things minimal. On the flip side of things, there are a lot of organizations um, struggling, like as with many, just in um, how they can operate, how they can receive funds, how they can do stuff. Tourism is obviously down and Vietnam uh, is big on tourism. There's a lot of money and dollars that come in from that. So, you know, there's a lot of businesses that have been under that. For us personally as an organization, um, you know, we've been, been doing okay, keeping our head above water, so to speak. Um, but at the same time, there has been a reduction in funds. And so we, we're trying to balance and budget accordingly so that, you know, we can still do what we were called to do. Um, but at the same time, you know, maybe at a reduced level. So our main focus sort of during this time has been a lot to do with medical, our medical side of programs. Mm. So our heart operations, our early detection clinics. So getting doctors into schools to check on kids. Um, and see how their heart and the respiratory systems and all that are doing. And then if they discover a heart defect or a heart murmur, then following them up with either um, some medication or a surgery if that's needed within the child's life. And so that's sort of been one of our main focuses um, during this time and just um, concentrating, I guess, on um, you know, all lives matter, but just concentrating on those, I guess, more susceptible during these times, um, you know, kids and families um, mm. and things that, you know, you don't want to put off. You don't want to put off a heart surgery um, during these times because that, you know, that could be um, life-threatening and, you know, yeah. to a child. So focusing a lot of a lot of things on that. So you really have to really prioritise uh, what's most important and just get through those um Whereas, you know, things that aren't as important sort of put on the back burner just a little bit in the meantime until you guys can get through these hard times, yeah? Yeah, I guess so to speak. I mean, you know, with every organisation, you've got to balance what you can do. Um, You know, we've still been able to do a little bit of stuff out in some of the communities uh, with funds that had kind of come in specifically for those needs and um, come in before COVID. And we've been able to set up some playground equipments for kids and give them a bit of um, thing and, um, you know, provide children with helmets. Um, Road safety is a big issue here. Um, Mm -hmm. It's the number one cause of deaths in Vietnam is deaths on the road. So we do a program where we help kids to learn safety on the road and we provide them with a free helmet so that they're wearing a helmet on their bike, you know, as they're traveling to and from school or going out with their, their parents on a motorbike. Um, and so things like that. So we, we're still, we've done a little bit of those things um, as needed, but trying to just focus on some of the more, I guess, pressing needs that are out there at the moment. Okay. So what, what is generally the main mode of transport? Is it like uh, mopeds and stuff like that over there or do people, many people have cars? Yeah. So um, it's a changing nation. It's a developing nation. So probably the main um, countrywide would be yeah motorbikes 250 cc most of them would be and um, and so cars are slowly starting to grow as well and then obviously you've got trucks that travel um, between states and provinces and and delivering stuff and moving things about okay so um how how have you managed uh, like with the you know the communities out there do you do you get much resentment like or are they do they in, you know like how can i say accept you with open arms have you re- had any challenges mm. on that side because you know they see that you're a westerner coming in 
and you know they might see that you're trying to overtake but um mm. have you had many challenges on that side of things yeah as always i mean i guess you can't really um you know everyone's perception and everyone's thoughts about you we do get i guess some um pushback but generally speaking uh we go into community and and you know we're we're welcomed with open arms vietnamese people are very um loving they're very um quick to just be friends with you and and so generally speaking most of our communities they're great you know they want to they want us there have lunch with us talk with us see how it goes and, and like i said before our premise is all about community-led development so we go into community and we don't tell them what mm-hmm. they need because like you said you know we're from the west it doesn't mean that we know what's best mm-hmm. um, nor do we live in that community yeah. You know, we ran those community 24-7 um, in or out of their schools every day. Our kids don't go there. We don't eat there. So what right do we have to go into the community and say, this is what you need, this is what you must have, these are the things that you should do when, and then we up and leave and we, we walk out. Um, so that's what we, so we don't do that. We don't tell them what they need to do, but we want to try and work alongside with them to help a, and build up their community. So after we do some training with them, we t- take them through a process of, of things that they can do to help their community and look at the resources in their community. We get them to map out the community, to draw it all out and write down which houses are here, which houses are there, what are their resources in their community. You know, even the unemployed person on the side of the road is a resource. They have time on their hands. You know, they have an ability and opportunity. So get them, you know, to, to look at every aspect within their community, what they can use um, and what they can do. And then we go from there. And so then they tell us, okay, these are the things that we want to see as our community develop in. Um, it may be putting in a soccer pitch and we might go, well, you don't need that. But as a community, they say, well, that generates community um, spirit, that generates community involvement together. And so that's what's something that we need. So we look at different aspects um, and some of those things we're able to help with, some of those things that we're able to tell them, hey, why don't you talk with these people or those people and they may be able to assist you with these things. Um, so it's, it's a balance um, of things that we can do and work with. So um, do you get involved with like the kids seeing the training in the schools and stuff like that? Yeah, so um, we some of the stuff that we, we do get involved with, some of the stuff we like to um, – get the teachers and the people in that community to do because they're involved in that area um, and some of the things that we help with. So, for example, some of the road safety things, um, we we do it ourselves. Um, we as an organisation, I say, not necessarily myself per se. Yeah. We've got a great team of people here. Um, and so we do some of that stuff. We just talk them through. We do a bit of silly and fun things. How do you put on a helmet? Does it go backwards, sideways, <laughs> without the strap on? And, yeah. you know, have a bit of fun with kids and just get them encouraged and telling us, you know, how to do things and, and move along. And so do a bit of those things. And then we get it for other things. We do some um, sexual abuse awareness training within communities. So just making kids aware of dangers and people around them and just for them to be aware and we do a lot of that outsourcing a lot of that's done fully in vietnamese and we get some people who are trained Mm. in that area and qualified and and so and they roll those things out within their own community is sexual abuse like a a really how can i say a common thing in vietnam Uh, it's estimated that between um one in four girls and one in six boys are sexually abused um, and so, you know, there's, there's been a lot of history. There's been um, a lot of things within the country's, um, I guess, past. Yeah. And that's caused, I guess, a lot of people to, to go down that path. It's getting a lot, a lot better. Mm. Uh, there's a department of the government called the Women's Union, and they're quite active in, one, in this area in particular um, and just enabling and speaking for the rights of children. Um, and making sure, and the organize, and the, I guess the, the the government department that we work closely with, which is Department of Labor, Invalids and Social Affairs, DELISA, um, mm. they're sort of I guess the main reporting body for some of these things. Yeah. And so we work in conjunction with them to roll out some of this training. The government's also set up some hotlines for children that are safe and they can call at any time. 
Mm. Um, and so we do a lot of putting advertisements out and awareness for kids for these boards and these numbers that they can call. And so we've put up a number of these um, throughout both provinces. So is this stuff happening within the communities or is it something like to do with like sex tourism? Uh, no, it's probably more, I guess. Um, you know, I mean, there, there is both. Uh, there are people who get picked out of Vietnam mm. um, to Thailand, Cambodia and get get forced in that sort of area. Um, and there's a lot also that happens within the community as well. Um, so it might be, you know, a neighbor down the road or it might be a family member, unfortunately, of some sort. Oh, wow. So they say that um, 98% of the children know their abuser mm. and 47% um, are a family member. Wow. So it's quite shocking results and, um, yeah, quite some yeah. shocking things that go on. Yeah, but no. uh, unfortunately, that's something that happens. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a scary thought, to be honest. Um, so with yourself and your partner, has it been easy to, like, because you've just, you, you're raising a family there, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is, is it easy to, like, raise a family while doing this development type of work? Mm. Um, yeah, so my wife and I, we moved here nine years ago. She was here um, a couple of years before that. Mm. Um, and so then we met, like I said, she moved back to, to Melbourne, to, to Australia. We got married and then we've been here for about nine years now. And we've got two kids. Uh, Vietnam is pretty much all they know. Mm. Uh, they've gone back to Australia a few times here and there. They were both born in Australia, one in Victoria, one in Sydney, um, New South Wales. So one for each team, so to speak, we like to say. Um, (laughs) But, yeah, I mean, there are difficulties along with it. You know, uh, they they love going to school here. They've got lots of friends here, uh, both expat kids, both Vietnamese friends. Um, So, you know, there's a range of of different things there. Uh, You know, there's always some difficulties they provide. Like with every family, you've got to budget for things. You've got to put things into place. For your kids, um, they go to great schools, um, got great educations. Uh, so yeah, there are some benefits and there are some some downsides. Probably one of the most downsides is that you know they don't get to see their family as often. Mm. As most people would, um, grandparents, cousins, aunties, uncles, and so yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I understand that because uh, you know I had a girlfriend who was basically raised in a. Philippines and her parents were doing missionaries mm. but um yeah she was attending international schools so um where it was just full of uh, you know students from parents from different parts of the world mm. you know because you do yeah. have a lot of organizations uh running out of these lower economic countries you know trying to mm-hmm. help build the communities and stuff like that so um there is some drawbacks but at the same time they get to make some uh, wonderful friends from around the world and a lot of these families they just they do they do spend a bit of time in these countries, but then eventually, for one reason or another, just like what happened with the prior um, people that were running AOG, you know, uh, they had to go back to their their home country. So um, yeah, when they go back, they still they still have those friendships there with uh, kids from around the world, and you know they get to you know have the opportunity to visit the world. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, yeah, so, definitely. Yeah, I mean. The kids love being exposed to new new things, and we try and get them exposed. And um, yeah, education. They don't go to um, a fancy international school, mm. um, but they go to um, a school. A couple of friends of ours um, initially sort of saw a need for here and and started running probably about uh, eight years ago yeah. or so. Um, and so yeah, they're loving it. They've got some some great mates on. It opens their eyes up as well to, to different things. Um, you know, yeah. I grew up in a very multicultural, you know, as you would know, we grew yeah. up in a very multicultural area. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, you know, with that, there comes different ideas and different things. And But it enlarges yourself as a person. It brings you aware of that, you know, different people do things in different ways hmm. um, and for different reasons. So, was, was it a bit of a culture shock for yourself uh, moving to Vietnam? Mm. Yeah, um, it was interesting. I didn't really, I guess, have a huge culture shock like most people, um, I guess, do. 
Uh, my dad's from India, my mom's from Burma originally, and they, they met in Australia. And so I grew up hearing a lot of stories about how they grew up and, and you know, how life was for them. So I never really wanted to move overseas because Australia is a good place. It's a yeah. good place to be. And, um, you know, there's a lot of benefits in living in Australia. And, uh, you know, you've got a, I mean, people have got a good in Australia compared to a lot of other places in the world. Um, and so I never really sort of had a desire sort of, you know, to do any of that. But, um, you know, as time went on, I just really felt, you know, God was saying, want you guys to go back to Vietnam and, you know, do something there for us. And, and so as we, we started to move on and we, we saw that happen, um, I didn't really sort of have a culture shock per se of going, oh, everything is being done different, I guess probably in the environment of which I grew up. Um, helped with that. But probably a lot of it um, that I felt frustrating at the initial time of moving was a lack of independence. Uh, my wife had been here for a number of years. She knew a bit more of the language than I did. Well, probably a lot more of the language than I did. She knew where to go th for things. And I just felt that I was at a position where I knew where everything was. And now I can't go anywhere. I can't speak anything. Mm. Um yeah, so in that sort of an aspect. And then once we kind of, you know, worked out a few things and I got a bit more independence, um, you know, we got a motorbike, I could go a few places, figure things out, uh, you know, that's just certainly helped. But so, you know. So what was some I of still the rely on her for directions though because I'm directing the challenge. <laughs> Fair enough. So what were some of the challenges for yourself adapting? Um, was it learning the language, um, getting to know your – orientation of the area you're in what were some of those mm. challenges i guess one of the the challenges and i guess it still happens um is i guess accepting that vietnamese do things differently than mm. you do um and they say things differently they act differently to things and um there's a frustration with the way things work and and how things and you may want to go but well, you could do it this way it's a lot easier but you know they do it their way but there are a lot of other benefits that come with that as well. You know, they're very relational people. And so things may take a little bit slower and longer, but you develop relationships. And once you have those relationships, a lot of things can go a lot easier for you down in the future parts. Uh, so there's, I guess, there's with every culture, with every um, country, there's you have your upsides, you have your downsides. It's adapting to the way people operate mm -hmm. and how they move, how they do things, and being patient and calm. Um, the roads drive me nuts here, <laughs> um, you know, but you know, you hear that from a lot of people. Um, but you know, I mean, that's, I think maybe one day I'll get over still yeah, haven't yeah. yet though. Um, so we just see how things go when things like banking is still, um, I don't understand, but you know, there's different laws in place and different ways that they do things to, you know, to combat um, corruption and, and to combat and them as a nation building up their infrastructure. Mm. So, yeah, a lot of things done differently and just accepting. Don't ask why too many times. <laughs> Learn the reason. Don't ask why. Just <laughs> accept, okay, this is the way things are and move on, so, which I'm still learning. <laughs> really? Um, so you were saying, you know, language uh, – is, do a lot of people speak English over there or are they just speaking Vietnamese and was it easy for you to communicate with people at the start? Mm. Uh, Vietnamese is, is the main language yeah. here um, and so everyone, I mean all the locals speak Vietnamese. There are a few different dialects um, out in the countryside and um, different, I guess, tonal way of saying things between the north and the south. Uh, so Vietnam is a tonal uh, language. They've got okay. six different tones, so yeah. I think they have the most tones okay. uh, language-wise throughout the world. And I am told on numerous occasions that I am tone deaf. <laughs> so you can say one word uh, one way and it means a totally different thing. So you can say ga or ga and it means chicken or train station or, oh, wow. you know, there's a number of different things. Whereas, you know, we write a word and it's that word is, you know, that, yeah. That's it, you know, but there's a lot of tonal marks and how you go up or how you go down or in the middle or you wave it through it, yeah. And so um, it's, it is a bit of a struggle for me. I am 
you know, I'm not, not great of it. Yeah. Um, so I'm working, you know, myself. Yeah. Um, you know, just to, to try and prove. The joke is I say that I speak great Vietnamese, yeah. except no one understands me. <laughs> so, you know, I'm working on the nation of Vietnam to understand me. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, I think of it like Mandarin is pretty similar as well, where uh, if you, it's, you know, it's all about the sound that you produce out of your mm-hmm. mouth. Um, yeah. That will help you to get the word out that you want to speak. But it's not always... Yeah easy when you're coming from the other side if you know what i mean especially like you Correct. say with english it's all pretty straightforward mm. word they might see it mm. as a sound but we have different sounds or for each word type of thing where mm-hmm. they have a very similar sound which can mean s- multiple words if you know what i mean is that right mm. yeah 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 very similar um yeah i think mandarin has maybe five different tones mm. um and so Vietnam, vietnamese has about six um, and so, yeah, it is, it's very different. It's the way you, you say the word in, in the, you know, um, in the right tone, in the right language. And, um, you know, if it's got a stroke through it, then it means this or it means, you know, and so, um, yeah, it's very different. And, and then you look at also English from a different perspective when you come here in English, I mean, English has so many different rules in the language and then it breaks all of those rules, yeah, yeah. you know, on different occasions, um, how you pronounce it. So it's also that other flip side of when people want to know a little bit more about English and they say, Oh, English is easy. Well, in some places, yeah, maybe, but you know, I mean, read and read mm. same word, which, you know, <laughs> how, where, when you're reading it, how do you read it and the context of it in the mm. sentence and, um, how do you say it and, you know, and I before E except after C and then. I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, just the way the word structure, yeah. Uh, yeah. So just to tying back a bit, with the government mm. itself, when you're doing your development, do you have any challenges with them? Uh, yeah, so as a nation um, or and especially, sorry, as a foreigner, we aren't, um, we don't, um, preach the gospel. We don't preach Jesus or anything. It's illegal for foreigners to, to, to do that in Vietnam. Mm. Uh, so our organization, so we're here for, for the sole purpose of just showing God's love to people and just showing God's love. You know, we don't speak anything out. We use our actions to show what we do and how we do things. Mm. We just, uh, we just show God's love and what we do. Matthew 25 says, um, that if you give a child a glass of water, then you've done it unto me, Jesus says. If you give a man a you know, cloak or a shirt off your back, then you've done it unto me. And I guess that's um, ultimately what we're here and why we're doing things. We're just showing God's love to the people mm. here in Vietnam and just um, you know, showing him what you do. We tell people a lot of the time that a lot of the funding that we get comes from churches back in Australia. And so we tell people about that and, and who's funded the things and you know, they fund it because they love the Vietnamese people and they want to see them grow and, um, you know, and have a better way of life. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's that's what we do. And the government keeps a close eye on the stuff that we do, uh, which sometimes we're grateful for. You know, they, they look out for us in what we what we do and say. And so, yeah, and they've um, – um, so they, they monitor us. They, they'll also just, you know, accompany us on trips when we go out into the villages um, and speaking with the locals and just making sure everything's above board and that we're doing things correctly. And we as an organization have no um, means to go about the government. We don't want to, um, you know, uproot them. We don't want to go a discord with them. We want to have a relationship with the government as well, with the government people there. We want to work closely together with everyone in what we do. Okay. So, you, yeah, they sort of keep you under the watching eye like Big Brother, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So, um, oh, what was I going to say? I just had a bit of a mind block there. Um, with the, the, how can I say it? Oh, bugger. Um, so the government, they, they watch you and they, they all that sort of stuff, right? Do you, mm-hmm. you're not allowed to talk about God. Um, do you get many people wanting to convert to Christianity? Um, because the main religion over there is Buddhism, yeah? Uh, communism is, Vietnam is a communist state, so there's no 
religion and communism, so to speak. Uh, okay. um, a lot of the people here um, maybe identify a little bit more with Buddhism. A lot of them do ancestral worship, um, mm. you know, where they believe they, they make offerings to their ancestors. They will bring them good luck, uh, which is a bit of a tie-in with Buddhism. Um, and then a lot of different people have different, different I guess, viewpoints and, and the way you look at things. Um, I want to say maybe three percent of the country, if not less, mm. um, has a Christian influence, whether it be Pentecostal or Catholicism or um, you know another kind of I guess stream of Christianity. Um, and so we we've had people ask in the past, and when people ask, we either just refer them on to a, a Vietnamese church or Vietnamese friends that we know. Um, it's a lot easier, obviously, for someone to explain in their own language and get them connected where they need to, you know, if ever that's the case. Okay. So, yeah, you can't really practice or run sermons or anything like that where you are, yeah? Uh, so we attend an international church, hmm. which is um, connected with another Vietnamese church. And so we do a bit of stuff um, through that. So we have an international service once a week on a Sunday. Um, and so, yeah, we do, I guess, uh, an, an, a normal, I guess, as you would call it, service on a Sunday. We have our worship. We have our preaching, our sermons, um, and our time to spend time in a community relationship with God. Um, okay. Look, I'm going to wrap it up from here, but uh, I do appreciate your time coming on to the show if people want to, you know, come and get involved and volunteer, are they able to? Yeah, yeah, we definitely um, love. Obviously, with uh, during this time, it's a bit hard. Yeah, um, but we'd love involvement from everyone. You can visit our website at www.aogwr.org, um, or visit our Facebook page, AOG World Relief um, yeah. Vietnam, and we're on Facebook, Insta got a lot of clips on YouTube as well that you can watch and some of the stuff that we do. Um, so there's different ways to get involved, um, come over, do some work, and that sort of depends on we have a number of teams that come over every year from Australia, so depending on how that works in conjunction with other people and then how long you're here for as well and skill set. There's a lot of different things, but shoot us a line. Definitely love to hear with you. Um, you know, and then if you come across any other resources that you think maybe work well, we're always open to expanding our knowledge and, and seeing how they, you know, how things work with that. And, and then there's also getting involved financially. If um, you want to donate towards the organization, anything specifically, like some of the stuff that I've mentioned or talked about, or if you just want to um, where most needed at the, at the time of our needs, and yeah, we can do some of that stuff too. Awesome. Will you be coming down to, back down to Australia at any time after this, you know, the borders reopen um, and doing any, like, how can I say, speeches and stuff like that, talking about what you do? Yeah, our usual premise is we're back in Australia every two years um, and we do a rotation on various different churches throughout the country. Uh, last time we hit pretty much every state and territory by WA. Yeah. Um, and we did that within a... I think it was a 14-week period. Um, so we move around to a lot of different churches, different different places and always available for a catch-up. We don't know when we're going to be back in Australia next. I mean, obviously, with travel restrictions and things that are happening, we never know what's going on at the moment. So, yeah, so I'm not sure about that. Um, could be next year, could be the year after that. Uh, we'll just have to see sort of what happens. Awesome. So, look, what I'll do is I'll leave the links that you've given us on the video now um, down in the description and the video on YouTube um, so people can reach out to you as well as your Facebook page and stuff like that. But um, from myself here, Neil Coots, don't forget to smash the like button if you enjoyed today's interview. As well as that, hit the subscribe button as well um, to keep in the loop with upcoming episodes and smash that notification bell there on the bottom right hand side. But from myself, Neil Coots and Calvin Windsor from AOG World Relief, thank you very much and have a good day.